as we gather together, we gather together with each other and in the presence of the Lord. And so we're going to lift our voices straight away to him. Page six of Joyful Noise. Come and praise him, royal priesthood. Come and worship him, holy nation. Worship Jesus, our Redeemer. He is precious, King of glory. O Lord our God, your greatness is seen in all the world. Your praise reaches up to the heavens. It is sung by children and babies. You are safe and secure from all your enemies. You stop anyone who opposes you. When I look at the sky which you have made, at the moon and the stars which you have set in their places, what is man that you think of him? Mere man that you care for him? Yet, you made him inferior only to yourself. You crowned him with glory and honor. You appointed him ruler over everything you made. You placed him over all creation, sheep and cattle and wild animals too, the birds and the fish. O oh Lord our God, your greatness is seen in all the world. Shall we pray? Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for your greatness and your love that has been perfectly focused for us in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that although you're holy and righteous, you seek our worship this morning. You seek to draw from us the adoration of our hearts, you seek to draw from us by your spirit worship which is in spirit and which is in truth. Thank you that your searching love brought us to yourself and that your sacrificial love has secured us with Jesus and in Jesus through the cross. Therefore, Father, we come boldly into your presence now through the living way that you've made for us into the very holy of holies, into the presence of the Father. Thank you that as we meet together now, you desire by your Spirit to do a fresh work, to speak and to meet us in new ways. So, Father, we just open our hearts to you now, asking that you will give that fresh vision of yourself, in Jesus' name, amen.
Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you have taken the journey ahead of us, that you know the way. Thank you that your way was a free choice through the path of the cross. We thank you that on the cross you gave your life in death, that we might really experience life. We thank you that through that cross, where there is weakness, your grace may be experienced. That where there is despair, you can give firm hope. That where there is defeat, you can give victory. That where there is bereavement, you can give comfort and peace. And so, Father, we come now before your throne, the high and lifted one, the one who, God, in the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, has given us the sense of all the glory that has been in the world from the beginning to the end. And we bring before you now ourselves as you see us with our need, and yet in who you want to complete your work as heirs and sons in the kingdom of God. We bring to you our worship. We want to see you and know you as Lord afresh. We bring to you the people of our nation that your word may be heard and received. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that the one you have given may be seen as Saviour and as Lord. The Lord's Prayer. going to take another step in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. We'll read Deuteronomy chapter 8, page 179 in the Old Testament of the Good News Bible. Obey faithfully all the laws that I have given you today so that you may live, increase in number, and occupy the land which the Lord promised to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you on this long journey through the wilderness, through the desert these past 40 years, sending hardships to test you so that he might know what you intended to do and whether you would obey his commands. He made you go hungry and then he gave you manna to eat, food that you and your ancestors had never eaten before. He did this to teach you that man must not live or depend on bread alone to sustain him, but on everything that the Lord says. During these 40 years, your clothes have not worn out, nor have your feet swollen up. Remember that the Lord your God corrects and punishes you just as a father disciplines his children. So then do as the Lord has commanded you. Live according to his laws and fear him. The Lord your God is bringing you into a fertile land, a land that has rivers and springs and underground streams gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land that produces wheat and barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives and honey. There you will never go hungry or ever be in need. Its rocks have iron in them, and from its hills you can mine copper. You will have all you want to eat, and you will give thanks to the Lord your God for the fertile land that he has given you. Make certain that you do not forget the Lord your God. Do not fail to obey any of his laws that I am giving you today. When you have all you want to eat and have built good houses to live in, and when your cattle and sheep, your silver and gold, and all your other possessions have increased, make sure that you do not become proud 
and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. He led you through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. In that dry and waterless land he made water flow out of solid rock for you. In the desert he gave you manna to eat, food that your ancestors had never eaten. He sent hardships on you to test you so that in the end he could bless you with good things. So then, you must never think that you have made yourselves wealthy by your own power and strength. Remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to become rich. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made with your ancestors. Never forget the Lord your God or turn to other gods and worship them and serve them. If you do, then I warn you today that you will certainly be destroyed. If you do not obey the Lord, then you will be destroyed just like those nations that he is going to destroy as you advance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, on this Palm Sunday, we remember that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that in that day when everybody else was so excited and thrilled, he alone fully realized that he was riding to his death. And in the name of him who was obedient even to death, we pray now that you will speak to us and teach us a simple lesson to be obedient children of a heavenly father. And we ask it for his name's sake. Amen. There is no doubt what the goal is that God is setting before his people in England and indeed throughout the world. It is summed up in the four words, let my people grow. But what is becoming clearer and clearer through the last few months is that that growth has three dimensions to it. He wants us to grow up, to grow big, and to grow out. In other words, to grow in maturity, in numbers, and in influence in that order. And this is the same goal that he set before the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He said, I want you to live and one of the signs of life is growth in maturity. I want you to increase in numbers and multiply. And I want you to occupy the land. So here is the threefold goal before God's people. To grow in maturity, in numbers, and in influence. And if God's people are going to do that, then there is one essential requirement, which is the key word in the book of Deuteronomy, and occurs more than any other word. It is the word obey, the unmentionable four-letter word in our society today. For one of the hardest facts with which we have to come to terms is that human nature is not by nature obedient. Disobedience comes to us more easily than obedience. We learn the word no before we learn the word yes as children. And I heard of one mother who was saying about her child, it's not my child's willpower that I have problems with. It's my child's won't power, which is a good deal stronger than my child's willpower. And you can almost hear a child say, shan't, won't. That comes instinctively to us. And since the fall and since Adam disobeyed his God, there is that within us which finds it easier to say, I won't have anybody else telling me what to do. I will do what is right in my own eyes. I'm a law to myself. And deep down, there is a spirit of lawlessness in human late nature which is only restrained by the hand of God upon us and upon our society. If God takes his hand off, if he lets off the handbrake, what happens? 
a spirit of lawlessness spreads through society. This week we've had one example after another of lawlessness spreading through this world in which we live. And the result of lawlessness? Violence. Romans 1 gives a dramatic picture of what happens when the wrath of God is on a society. When God gives men up, when he takes the brakes off and says, All right, if you don't want me, then behave without me. Do what you want and what happens. You'll find a list in Romans 1 of the things that break down in society when God takes his hand off. But one of the things right in the middle of a list of pretty horrible perversions and vices and crimes is the little statement, disobedience to parents. For that's where it begins within the home. And it spreads from there to school. And it goes on from there into society. And disobedience is characteristic of our human nature. Genesis 6 is another picture of what happens when God says, I'm not going to go on striving with men. If they don't want me, I'm not going to go on trying to restrain their human nature. And in Genesis 6, the result of God taking his hand off is violence filled the earth. And as we've read our newspapers this week and listened to the radio or watched the television news, we've seen the violence in the Middle East the PLO attack and the appalling Israeli act of retaliation and revenge. We've seen Senor Moro kidnapped in Italy and the whole country come into a situation of fear and tension. The South Moluccans in Holland have yet again held hostages. And here in this land, we've had teachers in schools on strike. Now, I'm not now arguing or commenting on the rights or the wrongs of the teacher's case, but I will tell you this, their pupils have learned the lesson of disobedience far more quickly than they have ever learned the lesson of obedience from their teachers. Within hours, the pupils learned that disobedience pays and that sit-ins bring benefits. And so those teachers have taught a very profound lesson to their pupils this week. And they are responsible for teaching that lesson. And they may have been struggling for weeks to get their children into obedience, but it only took hours to get them into disobedience. This is our human nature. And so obedience is something that doesn't come naturally. It has to be learned. And therefore it has to be taught. And it is one of the tasks of all those responsible for the young to teach obedience so that they may learn it. Our eldest daughter did her teaching practice in a secondary school with a very difficult class. And uh, she surprised us when she told us what happened. The first day they played her up. And so she said, right, you stay in for the whole of break and sit with your hands on your head. And she got away with it. And they sat there for the whole of break with their hands on the head. She had no more problems after that. And at the end of a few weeks teaching practice, the children were upset that she was leaving. And the obedience had moved through to something deeper. It had moved through to a respect and an affection, which turned obedience from something that was based on fear into something that was based on loyalty. Now, true obedience needs to be learned first in that simple way of reward for obedience and punishment for disobedience. But if obedience doesn't progress beyond that simple stage, it is not obedience. If it is only related to reward and punishment, it never has been learned. It is still disguised self-interest. And so the real test of obedience comes when there is no reward for obedience and no punishment for disobedience. It is in those circumstances where real loyalty will be shown. And so with the children of Israel, God had to take them through class one where it was simply a case of if you disobey, you will be punished. If you obey, you will be rewarded. But he was constantly putting them through tests 
exams, if you like, and part of all learning is testing, to see if their obedience had progressed from the simple self-interest that did not want to be punished or did want reward to that kind of obedience which is not so much interested in self as responding to a relationship with the one who is to be obeyed. This is where Deuteronomy fits in. There are in this chapter the two simple but severe tests of obedience. The most severe tests, the acid tests, as to whether obedience has passed beyond the self-interest to something that is loyally, trustful, loving, wholehearted response to someone whose wishes are to be obeyed. The first test is the test of poverty, the test of hunger, the test of finding that when you obey there is no reward and things do not work out right and things get into difficulty, things go wrong. That's the test. Are you obeying because obedience leads to things going right or are you obeying for a deeper reason than that? That's the first test. You've heard the old saying that honesty is the best policy. Well, frankly, the sequel to that is if it's only the best policy, then it's not honesty. The real test of honesty is when it doesn't pay. If you can be honest when you lose by it, then you are an honest person. If you are simply honest because it's good for business, that's not honesty. But if you're honest when it's bad for business, and increasingly that is the case today, then that is honesty. If you're obedient when it is the best policy and it pays, that is not obedience. It is simply a Pavlovian response. And a dog drooling at the sound of a bell is in the same category as someone who is obedient because it pays to be obedient. Now let's look at the first test. Moses says, remember how the Lord led you through the desert and let you go hungry. As much as to say, it all went wrong. You obeyed God in leading, leaving Egypt. You went out after Moses. He told you where to go. And when you got there, there was no food. You ran out of food and you were hungry. And they remembered that even as slaves... They'd had good food, they'd had garlic and onions and spice stews and if we read all that they had, I'd make your mouth water. They had real Sunday lunch, even as slaves. And yet God said, I let you go hungry. To see what was in your heart, to find out whether your intention was really to be obedient or whether you were only doing it because of the things I did for you. And it was a test. There is an expression on the mission field, which thank God is now dying out, but the expression was rice Christians. And it referred to those who responded to Christian relief in handing out rice to starving people by responding then to the missionaries' appeal to become Christians. And they were rice Christians who became Christians in order to get the rice. Israel has passed a law recently which makes it a crime to be bribed into becoming attached to another religion. It was rushed through on Christmas Day, no less, by an orthodox minority in the Knesset. And those of us who were informed by the Israeli Information Office about the new law have written back and said, what does this mean? Have you evidence that people were being bribed into becoming Christians within Israel? that they were being offered material benefits in order to accept the Lord. We've had letters back assuring us that this only covers those who become Christians because they have been offered material benefits as a deliberate bribe. But if we become a Christian in response to that, we have not truly become a Christian. And I have no knowledge whatever of any example of a Christian, someone becoming a Christian in Israel because of bribery. I fear that there may be the thin end of a wedge here to discourage changing from one religion to the other. But to bribe someone into trusting and obeying the Lord is not honest. It is not the real thing. It's not right. 
Well, now God tested the children of Israel. He put them in the desert and he said, you're without food, now let me see what is in your heart. Let's see if you can go through a time when it doesn't pay to be obedient. Let's see if you trust me enough to go on walking in that direction, even though there's no food in that direction. Let me see. It was the first test of their obedience. And he was teaching them one important thing, that faith is more important than food. To put it in a simple word, this meal of bread and wine you're going to have in a moment is more important to you than roast beef and Yorkshire pudding an hour later. Man does not live by bread alone. That's the lesson he was trying to teach them. That if we are living for bread as our top priority, then we are no better than the animals. That doesn't mean we don't need bread. To say we don't live by bread alone means that we live by at least bread. But to put it in a cliche that will perhaps fix in your memory, it is more important for us, for life, to have what God comes out of God's mouth than to have what comes into our mouth. I'm so glad we just sang the Lord's Prayer there. Because you said or sang in that prayer, your will be done before you sang, give us this day our daily bread. You got your priorities right. Faith is more important than food. And if ever it comes to a choice, then it is better to be obedient and starve than to be disobedient and live. That is the truth of this verse. Now, how are we going to pass this test? It comes to us not just in being hungry. It's come to me, and I dare say it's come to every other Christian here. When to be obedient to God has led you into a situation where everything seems to go wrong. Have you had that experience? When to do what you felt He wanted you to do seemed to lead you not into blessing, but into the opposite seemed to lead you into a jungle, seemed to lead you into the dark, seemed to lead you into an experience of being forsaken by God when it seemed as if he didn't care for you. How are you going to pass that test? Well, the key to most exams and most tests is memory. Indeed, I remember with envy a student at college who had a photographic memory. And three days before the exam, he would go into the library, he would read everything he'd studied, and for about a week he could hold it. And he used to go into the exam room and sit down, and you watched his hands scribbling everything down. If you'd asked him ten days later, he'd forgotten everything. And I used to envy this man. Memory gave him the key to passing his exams, and he went sailing through them. But in fact, to pass every test, the key is memory. And so Moses says, do you remember that test? You went without, you got into difficulties, you got into a place where you felt God isn't caring for me. The answer is remember what? Remember that God is your father and he's dealing with you as children. If you remember that, you will not say that God is deserting me or punishing me, but that like a father with his child, he's teaching me something. He wants me to mature and to learn. I know of a very wealthy father. He's dead now, but he was very wealthy and he had three sons. And when he was nearing the end of his life, he got those three sons together and he said this to him, Sons, I have made my will and I have left everything to charity. I have left you nothing. And that is the best thing I can do for you as my sons because I want you to make good. I want you to do what I've had to do and start from nothing. I want you to have to tackle life as I've had to tackle it. I want the best for you so I'm leaving you no money. And every one of those three men has made good outstandingly good. Remember that God is caring for you as a father cares for his children. And if a father really cares for his children, there are times when he may test their obedience. It is not because he wants them to die. It's not because he wants them to get into difficulties. 
After all, says Moses, remember that following that test, God gave you manna from heaven and your clothes didn't wear out in 40 years. Now imagine that. Life would be considerably more economical if our clothes lasted 40 years. From the day you start work to the day you retire. And yet God said, look, your clothes didn't wear out. And all that tramping through the wilderness, you kept in good health. Your feet never swelled up. And God looked after your food, your clothes, and he gave you water from flint rock. God's a father. And therefore, if he puts you through a difficult time, it's not to damage you. It's not to kill you. It's not to do harm to you. It's in order to make you a grown-up son. It's to help you to mature. It's because he wants you to grow up that he does this. So when this test comes and obedience seems to lead the wrong way and to lead you into difficult circumstances, then remember that God is treating you as a father treats his children and therefore pass the test and you'll find he provides the manner and your clothes will not wear out and your feet will not swell and you'll carry on towards the promised land. Now I can't leave this passage without thinking of the Lord Jesus himself, can you? There is a remarkable parallel between Israel and Jesus. When Israel went through the Red Sea, for the next 40 years they were in the wilderness and they went through hunger as a test of their obedience. When Jesus went through the waters of the Jordan in his baptism as an act of obedience, doing what God had told him, for the next 40 days God put him in the wilderness where there were no shops, no food. In other words, God put him to the test of six weeks without food. Having obeyed the Lord in baptism, you'd have thought the Lord would have led him straight into blessing, straight into power, but no. Six weeks without food. And one of the amazing things to me is that the Son of God became such a real human being that he had to learn obedience by the things he suffered. He had to learn it like I do. And he learned it through suffering. He learned it through difficulty. He learned it through going hungry the same way that Israel had to learn it. And at the end of six whole weeks, the devil came to him and made an attempt to get him to disobey and said, why don't you turn these stones into bread? You can now that you're the son of God. You've been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Look at those stones. They look just like broken bread. Why not turn them into bread? Why not satisfy this gnawing hunger in your stomach? It was an attempt to get Jesus to disobey his father. And Jesus found the clue to his experience and the answer to the devil in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And he turned on Satan and said, you've forgotten something. There is something even more important than bread, and that is obedience. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Get away, Satan. I have my priorities right. I didn't realize that baptism was going to lead to six weeks hunger. I didn't realize that the Spirit would lead me into the wilderness rather than into a ministry. I didn't realize I was going to suffer like this. I didn't realize I was going to be alone. I didn't realize I'd have to do without food. But Satan, you are not going to break me in this test. I'm going to pass it and I'm putting the word of the Lord first. And the result was that later when Jesus came under similar pressures, he was able to stand because he'd learned obedience. He'd passed the test. He'd come through a difficult time when there seemed no reward for getting baptized, no blessing to follow his obedience. And mark my words, the one reason why Jesus was baptized was this. He said, it is right for us to do what's right. He did it for obedience, and his obedience was not immediately rewarded. He was tested in that obedience. And if I say to God, God, I'm willing to obey you, I can expect that God will take me at his word and say, Right, I will put you where there's no food and see what is in your heart and see if you mean it. Now that's the first test of obedience. 
The second test is mentioned in the second half of the chapter. It's just the opposite. One test of obedience is poverty, where there is no immediate reward. The other is prosperity, where there is no immediate punishment. And this is a more subtle and a more severe test. The manna was to give way to the rich diet that I read for you. Did it make your mouth water? Wheat and barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives and honey. There are cereals on your breakfast table now that are almost a combination of all those things. Special breakfast cereals, which have all these delightful things coated with honey too. I confess that I had some this morning. <laughs> and you're going into a land where you won't have this dull, monotonous diet of manna. The same every day, manna on Monday, manna on Tuesday, manna on Wednesday. Why, I've heard that school dinners, you can tell it's Thursday because it's rice pudding, but supposing it was rice every day and nothing but, just manna, 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 until they were sick to death of manna. But now they're going into a land with pomegranates and figs and wheat and barley, all coated with honey. And they're going into a land where the hills are full of iron and copper. Everything's there, they've just got to dig for it. It's there. Now for Israel, it was a tremendous test of their obedience to pass from the desert, the nomad existence, to an agricultural existence. I'll tell you why. It has a subtle psychological effect. If you are on a richer diet and you get it because you put more effort into it, the subtle psychological effect is, I don't need God. I don't need Him anymore. When you're having to gather manna and you know that unless God drops it during the night, it won't be there in the morning, it's comparatively easy to remember God. And you don't have to do much to get your food. You just have to take a basket and go out and pick it up. But when you're in an agricultural life, when you dig for it, and when it's there, it's in the ground, it's in the soil, and it grows, and it comes up, and if you dig and plant, up it comes, and you harvest it, you work for it, it's just that much easier to forget that every day you depend upon God for your daily bread. How much more for us who have moved from an agricultural to an industrial society, where our food comes not from heaven, or even from the soil, but from the supermarket. And it comes looking as if God had nothing to do with it. It comes in polystyrene, pressed and vacuum packed. It says to us, factory, man-made, man-made. And the result is it is even more difficult for us to say, give us this day our daily bread and really mean it because we don't get it from God. We get it from the supermarket. I remember Eamon Andrews introducing a child in the East End of London, and he could not persuade this child that milk came from cows. It didn't come from cows, it came in cartons from the factory and it was brought on a milk float. And so we are even further removed from that direct dependence upon God that they had in the desert where they picked up the food that God dropped every night. In the desert they could say, give us, actually it doesn't mean today, the literal translation of the Greek is, give us for the next 24 hours the bread we need. How easy to pray that when manna drops from heaven each night. How more difficult to pray that when you dig for it and you wait for it and you harvest it and you grind it and you bake it. How much more difficult when mother's pride comes to you in a plastic case to say, give us for the next 24 hours the bread that we need. Most of us in this church have probably got it already stored within our large or deep freeze. How difficult to say that in prayer and mean it. The test of prosperity. And Moses said you're going into a land where you will never go hungry, where you will have all you need to eat. Oh, don't forget. If you do forget, says Moses, two dangers come. The first danger is pride. 
Now, why should pride come? Because we forget that God gives us our daily bread. I'll tell you quite simply. Pride comes because prosperity leads to presumption and presumption to pride. Prosperity leads to presumption and the presumption is, I have become wealthy, I have earned this, I have got this food, I am responsible. And as soon as you start sentences with the pronoun I, then pride comes. See what I have done. And in an industrial society, man is more tempted than ever not to give thanks to God for his achievements, but to say, look what I've achieved. Looked at my, look at my technology. Look at my computers. Look at my trip to the moon. And I did it all without God. And that's presumption, and that's pride. And the second danger when you forget God in a prosperous society, in the light of man's achievements, the second danger is paganism. Because if you forget God, you leave a God-shaped blank in the human soul, and human nature, like nature, abhors a vacuum. Something's got to come in and fill that vacuum. Some false god has got to come in and fill the blank. Other gods will come in. Forget the Lord your God and other gods will creep in, said Moses. That's the danger. Pride and paganism. What other gods will creep in? Well, in their day, the pagan gods of fertility that were already worshipped in Canaan. The gods of the people around. In our day, in our secular society, I don't think it will be religious gods other than the fringe religions that have crept in, Zen Buddhism, Spiritism, Occultism. But for the majority of the people, it's different gods. Driving up the M1 yesterday, the southbound lane was packed with cars and with buses, and from the windows there were scarves of red and white. There were posters on the windscreens and on the back windows. The whole southbound lane was jammed with red and white people. Knott's Forest was in town, and they were coming down that motorway. I, I found myself thinking all kinds of thoughts. I thought, oh, if only they were going to worship God. But their gods are 11 men kicking around a piece of leather. For that's their main affection, their ambition, their interest. And that's become a god. And there were thousands of them pouring down the M1 to worship their God. Thought if only they were coming to worship our God and began to wonder if only our people were coming to church with scarves flying out the window. Red and white, there are colors, not theirs. They're the colors of death. That's why they're on a barber's pole. The old bloodletting was the job of the barbers. That's why when my wife had a third confinement and I took red and white carnations into her, the nurse wouldn't put them in a vase. It was superstitious. It would bring death in the ward. But white and red are the colors of spilt blood and flesh from which the blood has been drained. They are the colors of bread and wine. There are colors. There are God. And if our society makes gods of people and goddesses of people, the scenes at the death of the French singing star this week just showed as the coffin was carried into church, the thoughts were not of God who gave the man a voice. The thoughts were of a man who was a god, a multimillionaire after 10 years at the top of the charts. And if we don't make gods of people, we make gods of things. And if we don't make gods of things, we do the worst thing and make a god of ourselves. And say to ourselves, the first commandment is this, Thou shalt have no other gods but me, myself only shall I serve. That's the danger of forgetting God in prosperity. How do we overcome that? test? How do we get through it? The answer is again memory, memory. Use your memory for three things. Number one, remember the past, said Moses. Remember where you were when God first spoke to you. Just try and think this morning as you come and take this bread and wine. Remember where would, God, where would you have been if God had not stepped into your life? What would you be doing now? What kind of a life would you be living now? Where would you have been now? Israel, you would have been slaves in Egypt, but God got you out of there. 
Where would you have been? Some of us, I believe, in this place would have been in prison right now if God had not stepped in. Other of us would have been bored. Some of us would have committed suicide. I don't know where we would have been if God had not stepped in. Remember the past. And remember the present, says Moses. Remember that even though you did earn that, even though you did make that, even though you did achieve that, even though you did that, who gave you the health and the strength and the ability to do it? You may have got a good wage this week, but who gave you the strength to get it? Whether you work with your hands or your head, how did you get that ability? It was God who gave it to you. And remember your future too. Remember all that God is going to do for you and remember all that is there in your future. Because if you forget the Lord your God and adopt the gods of the people around you, you have no future. You have no future. You will perish as they perish. My time has gone, so let me conclude with saying just one or two things. First, which do you think God really wants for you, poverty or prosperity? I have no doubt whatever about that. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be rich. He doesn't want to have to keep you in poverty. He may take you through it. He may make you through it take you through the first test, but only in order that he may bless you with good things. God wants his children to be wealthy but not spoiled. And so he may test you and test your obedience so that, as Moses says, in the end, he may bless you with good things and you will handle them without forgetting that behind every gift lies the giver. But let me come back to Israel. Did they pass the second test? The sad answer is no, they failed. They failed, and the result is they lost their blessing. But one Jew passed. One Jew was obedient from the beginning of his life to the end. A Jew called Jesus, and his obedience began in the home and in the family where it says he was subject to his father and mother, to Joseph and Mary, he learned obedience right there. And from there it spread through the rest of his life. Now make no mistake, obedience didn't come easily to Jesus. If you got the idea from Sunday school that Jesus just found it a delight always to be obedient, then come into the desert and listen to the pressure on him when the devil is at him. Or better still, come into Gethsemane. And this week we've got a chance to think of the obedience of Jesus to a unique degree. Come into a garden where he's so anxious that that medical phenomenon of drops of blood being squeezed out of the pores of the forehead takes place because there is a battle on. His will is not finding it easy. Father, if it's possible, not this way, please. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Do you know the idea has got around that you have a stronger will if you're disobedient than you have if you're obedient. That being obedient is sissy and weak-willed. On the contrary, that's a perverted thought of our fallen minds. It takes more strength to be obedient than it does to be disobedient. It takes more character, more self-discipline to set your face to go to Jerusalem because that's the will of God. And that was Jesus. And his will was so in harmony with the will of God that like two tuning forks, they vibrated together. But it wasn't easy. My will is to do the will of him who sent me. My will is his will. And it took every bit of courage and self-discipline and determination that Jesus had as a human being to say, not my will but yours be done. And he became obedient even to death even death on a cross and it took more strength to say yes to God than to say no. So the idea that if you assert your own will and say no, shan't, won't, that that makes you strong, an idea which is ripping through our society is wrong. Strength of will is to say 
with drops of blood on your forehead, not my will, but yours. And Jesus said it. And this, the result is not only did he give us the perfect example of obedience, even when it did not pay, but through that obedience, he did something for us that ancient Israel never had. He made possible a change of heart and will so that I could have a desire to want to do the will of God. As you come to this communion, just remember that the first miracle Jesus was tempted to do was to turn stones into bread. The first miracle he did do was to turn water into wine. The first would not have been a miracle of God. It would have been disobedience. The second was a miracle of God. And the Virgin Mary came in with that lovely phrase to the servants at the wedding at Cana. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And the result was they had a wedding reception such as they'd never had before. And on the last night of his life, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he took wine. And he said, do this. Do it. To remember. And it is an act of obedience. And an act of remembrance. Which should characterize the life of those who are going to grow in maturity, numbers, and influence. Let us pray. As a prayer, I'm going to read a little hymn of a saint of 400 years ago. My God, I love thee, not because I hope for heaven thereby, nor yet because who love thee not are lost eternally. Thou, O oh my Jesus, thou didst me upon the cross embrace, for me didst bear the nails and spear and manifold disgrace, and griefs and torments numberless, and sweat of agony, in death itself and all for one who was thine enemy. Then why, O oh blessed Jesus Christ, should I not love thee well, not for the sake of winning heaven or of escaping hell, not with the hope of gaining aught nor seeking a reward, but as thyself hast loved me, O ever-loving Lord, e'en so I love thee and will love and in thy praise will sing because thou art my loving God and my redeeming King. Amen.